Welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Thank you for joining us today for part two of our program, Sexual Assault 101, Medical Issues of Sexual Assault. Part one was broadcast last week, Introduction to the Dynamics of Sexual Assault and Alabama Laws on Sexual Assault, and it is now available on demand from our website. If you have a question about anything being discussed today, please call or email during our broadcast. The phone number and email address are on your screen now and will appear again later in the program. Also, the handout, sign-in sheet, and evaluation are all available online. You will need to register for this program in order to access those materials. Continuing education credits have been approved for nurses and social workers for today's program. In order to receive credit for this training, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in sheet and evaluation. While content may continue to be relevant, continuing education credit will only be awarded for one year for nurses expiring on June 30th, 2017, and two years for social workers expiring on June 30th, 2018. If you are watching this program on demand and want to receive a social work continuing education certificate, you will need to complete the social work test and send it in along with your sign-in sheet and evaluation. If you are watching this program live, there is no social work test required. I'm Renee Carpenter, State Social Work Director for the Alabama Department of Public Health. And joining me, we have Valtoria Jackson with the Lighthouse Counseling Center. Welcome, Valtoria. Thank you so much, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Val I'm Valtoria Jackson with Standing Together Against Rape. We are a program of Lighthouse Counseling Center. I am a sexual assault nurse examiner, uh, and I coordinate sexual assault nurses as well as train sexual assault nurses for our program, Standing Together Against Rape. We're going to discuss the medical issues of sexual assault, which even social workers are, are very integral when referring people to get a sexual assault nurse exam, as well as enlighten our nurses that do not work in the emergency room or facilities that do rape kits, that when you talk to a patient, you'll be able to explain what happens during a forensic examination. I'll use the word forensic examination and sexual assault nurse examination um, uh, intricately, you know. Uh, so anyway, but one of the first steps in providing care immediately following sexual assault is to encourage the victim to seek medical attention. Even though there's no obvious injuries or medical concerns um, that you may see outright, still that victim needs to get seek some medical attention. And always be aware of where that medical attention can be received in your community. It could be the health department, emergency room, but STAR is a freestanding facility in Montgomery, Alabama. We're located on Lawrence Street in the One Place Family Justice Center at this time. Uh, we service the areas Montgomery, the counties, Montgomery, Otago, Elmore, Butler, Lowndes, and Crenshaw counties. Recently, we've been able to expand into the Dallas, Perry, and Wilcox counties. Now, emergency room treatment is not always necessary for a sexual assault examination if you have a freestanding facility within your community. Uh, but an, an examination is important if the sexual assault victim reports within 72 hours of the suspected assault. This is very important. Why? You have two primary reasons for a medical examination. Number one, it provides immediate medical care by treating injuries, offering sexually transmitted infection, prophylactically medication, and pregnancy information. As well, it serves as a means of collecting evidence. Collection of evidence can only be done within 72 hours of the assault. This is the Alabama state standard, but some states go up to 102 hours, some states go up to 96 hours, and uh, as you met Jennifer on the previous um, session, that we are looking into um, addressing our legislature and increase these hours because if you know anything about sexual assault, it does take more than 24 hours for that victim many times to even report or tell anybody she was assaulted. So, but for the state of Alabama, the evidence needs to be collected within 72 hours of assault. Now, what do you want to tell the victim if they call you and say, I was just raped last night, I didn't give him permission to uh, have sex with me, uh, I want to report. It's within that 72 hours. 
recommend that they do not bathe, shower, wash hands. We want to protect the evidence. Do not brush their teeth or gargle. Do not eat or drink if possible. Do not use the bathroom. Do not change clothes that they were wearing during the sexual assault. Do not touch or move any items in their home or on their bodies or on their personal in the car that may have uh, the assailant's DNA. We want to preserve as much evidence as possible. Again, reasons for seeking emergency medical care is the survivor may be in, in, in shock. Uh, they may have internal or external injuries, genital bleeding. They may be pregnant. They may have consumed a high amount of drugs or alcohol or have uncontrolled be behavior. Now, if you have a victim that experiencing any of these, they do need to go to the emergency room. Um, but we know the emergency room these days. You know, there are our primary care centers in some facilities, and they may have a long waiting period. So, sadly, sexual assault is not considered a high priority in our busy emergency rooms. We've had victims wait uh, an average of 8 to 10 hours. And that's, that's difficult because that victim right there is going through shame, guilt, uh, and other emotions. But, as you see, we have things that are a little bit more urgent in the medical profession's uh, view other than a sexual assault. So, but what can you do? We need you to help the survivor identify they have medical needs. We need to help them find the best place to meet those needs, be it an emergency room or a freestanding facility. Or they may can wait a day. Um, the survivor may be unaware of any injury sustained in the assault. Listen to their story. Did he, um, did she sustain a blow, he or she, did they sustain a blow to their abdomen or their head? Did they fall asleep? Did they, are they having trouble remembering? That may need emergency care. Or may not, or they may not even know where to go for the medical assistance. You need to help them along. So have your resources in place. Medically stable patients of any age should be referred to a rape crisis center in your county or even outside your county. Um, just, just call the, um, the national hotline of RAIN and they will assist you in directing a victim. Um, preferably, we would love our goal for the state of Alabama that every sexual assault victim is seen by a sexual assault nurse examiner, someone that has had additional training to their registered nurse training to collect forensic uh, evidence. Non-medically stable patients should be referred to an emergency room so that they can stabilize them and then maybe ship them to or a, uh, to a sane facility or a sane nurse can go to the emergency room in some areas. The SANE on call in our uh, facility can assist with a phone assessment of the patients and help you to see do they need to go to the emergency room or can they wait a day or can they be transported to a standalone facility. There's okay. help out there. You mentioned SANE and RAIN. Can you tell us what those stand for? RAIN is the oh, R-A-I-N-N. -N. It's a national organization, rape. I hate to say I can't think off the top of my head. Okay. If you just Google, <laughs> Google is good. Get it on your smartphone. But it has two R-A-I-N-N, -N, National Network. I know that. Uh, rape uh, something, Intervention National Network, and I'm sorry. Incest. But, I think it's yeah, incest. Incest, <laughs> yes. But they are the national hotline that will put you in touch with the uh, facility closest to your location, okay. including the, our facility in Montgomery. We're part of the RAIN network. And every rape crisis center in the state of Alabama is part of RAIN network. So instead of trying to memorize all our local numbers, just go to RAIN. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but SANE is sexual assault nurse examiner. That's the nurse, the registered nurse that's had at least two years of professional experience and has taken a 40-hour course and has received clinical hours in the sexual assault examinations. So that, that qualifies you as a SANE. And then there's another professional um, step. They can take a national certification administered by the International, IFAN, International Association of Forensic Nurses. Okay? So I've just confused everybody with all these acronyms. I know. It's tough. <laughs> but nurses are used to it. You know, we, we operate on medical acronyms. And so, but, but uh, let's see. The, so we finished with that. Again, busy, busy, busy emergency room. I, I spent 30 years there, and that's one reason I got into forensic evidence, because I was the only nurse that would volunteer to go into the room for four hours and spend that time collecting the kit. And so I learned, um, sort of self-taught at first before I took the training. But when you're in the emergency room, there's so much going on that, um, sadly, sexual assault victims are put um, 
the lowest triage number and would have to wait. Barriers to examination. One of the biggest barriers clients receive in seeking medical attention is, is uncertainty about involving law enforcement. Again, I'm sure you heard from Kathleen, our, our counterpart, that all the emotions that the sexual assault victim is dealing with, shame, guilt, uh, and they do not want to involve law right away. Um, if they were involved in illegal drugs or in an illegal activity or they have a warrant for their arrest, they don't want to run to the police. So that's one of our biggest barriers that clients perceive in, in, even, in even seeking medical attention. The decision to prosecute can be made at a later time, and I'm sure y'all heard that previously. Over the age of 18, the victim has the right to involve law enforcement. It's called the Jane Doe Law, and we really, really, really want to press this issue because sometimes when you go into the emergency room or come to health, I don't know how health department handles it when somebody says, I was just sexually assaulted. Do you call the police right away? No, that victim, if they're over the age of 18, has the right to decide when law enforcement is involved in uh, prosecution or in just to report it. They can have a Jane Doe kit and their name will not even go on the evidence until they decide that they want to um, they want to prosecute and involve law enforcement. It is typically better for the victim to go ahead, consent to evidence collection before the evidence is lost. And that's what we want you to encourage. If it's within 72 hours, say, hey, go here, go to the hospital, go wherever, and have the evidence collection and take your time to make the decision to involve family, friends, or law enforcement. It'll be just between you and me okay, until you decide that you want to go further. For our facility scheduling the examination, if the client decides to have the examination or call law enforcement or request what's better known a rape kit, they call our 24-hour hotline. That's our number, and you saw it on the um, on the first slide at your facility. And you can call us at any time if you need any information. It's 334-213-1227, 24 hours a day. We have a sexual assault nurse examiner on call, as well as an advocate, a patient advocate, that if somebody just wants to call and talk. Information needed when you schedule an exam. Of course, their name, age, date, time, and location of assault because, of course, police jurisdiction is important and any potential injuries. Um, the nurse will need that. Now, this examination. Believe it or not, any licensed medical personnel can collect the evidence collection kit. Still today, we have uh, facilities that receive rape victims that have to stay in the emergency room or they're in an outlying small county and they cannot get to a freestanding facility for a sexual assault nurse examiner or there's no sexual assault nurse examiner in that facility, they tell the victim we do not do them here and we can't do them. No, any licensed medical personnel can collect an evidence collection kit or a rape kit. Um, doctors can do it with the assistance of a nurse or a nurse can do it on her own depending on their facility's um, protocol and procedure. But a patient should never be denied a rape kit because um, um, SANES are not available. Okay. Again, there's our address and soon to be we'll be having a mobile unit out of the rural counties and we'll talk about that later on. After the appointment is set, we'll meet the victim at our facility as well as an advocate, a community advocate that comes to be there just to focus on the patient's comfort and need is always um, there for the patient. Persons 14 years of age or older can consent to their own medical treatment. This is where it gets a little confusing because you have a 14-year-old who's dating an 18-year-old and mom wants to report DHR is involved and they bring them to the uh, medical examination and they can actually refuse. They can refuse. Fortunately, we've had this a couple of times, but when we tell them it's for their um, um, medical um, examination is important, pregnancy determination is important, and treatment, most of the victims w do consent when, it's, when they're informed and they understand what's going on, and you, do, and you do tell them about their rights. So we have not had a 14-year-old just walk away or refuse uh, medical treatment. But that does, you know, we do have to respect their rights. That they, then we have to get their consent as well as their parents' consent. And with their consent, can parents be involved? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so victims can de decline and, and assure them if anything's become uncomfortable during the examination, they can decline any part of the um, 
forensic examination that they're not comfortable with. Now, medical personnel must follow very strict instructions when collecting evidence. Once they open the kit, and I have a kit here. Is that okay, y'all? I have a kit here. This is what the state of Alabama sexual assault evidence collection kits looks like. When um, the kit is received, it is sealed on both ends. I've opened one end before I got here. Um, and when it's opened, the person collecting the evidence cannot allow this kit to leave their hands. And that's for chain of custody um, reasons. So you have to remain with this kit at all times. And you see that's a major challenge when you're in an emergency room and you have three or four other uh, patients that you need to see. There's strict instructions in here. There's 12 steps to the collection of this kit, but here they're very simple. If two people go in that have never received training, one can read the, um, the instructions while the other perform, and that is just as well as having a trained SANE at that time. Okay? All parties involved need to wear gloves to be careful not to contaminate evidence, and that's solely because you have DNA on your fingers. <laughs> okay? You don't want your DNA in the kit. So uh, put gloves on, don gloves before you open the kit, and exchange your gloves every um, so often so that when you have any contact where someone else's DNA is not put into kit. Um, paper bags are always used to collect evidence, particularly their clothes, never plastic. Reason why? Remember the old biology days? The plastic and moisture breeds things, <laughs> those little sticky germs. And so these kits sometimes are stored up to two, three, four, five, six, seven years, even three months. You put plastic in here with some DNA and moisture, they're not able to test anything. So always use paper bags to collect any type of evidence. And it's okay to use things that are not in the kit as long as they're sterile. You may need extra Q-tips or extra bags. Uh, we just like to brag about our center. We have a forensic exam room. And my dream is that every hospital will have an exam room or every, facility, every community or county will have a standalone because doing a sexual assault, the family and the patient needs to be treated with compassionate in a home type environment, not the sterile emergency room. So first thing, we'll ask the medical history. The doctor of the same will ask questions about the assault, their health history, including past medical and surgical problems, their menstrual history, and the use of contraception. In practice, we find out the first thing we do after getting the basic demographics and, and allergies and medical history, we get a narrative of the assault early on. Because early in the history taking, that directs our examination. For instance, during the assault, there was never any contact with their hands with the assailant. There was never any type of oral contact. Why do we need to swab their mouth? We don't need to because it wasn't involved. It narrows in and focuses in exactly what happened, and that part of the body is what we examine. Other questions of the assault could include time, place, date of attack, number of attackers, and what did each attacker do? Uh, threats of violence, uh, what words did they say? Uh, were any restraints used? Was definitely if there was any strangulation. If any time did they gag or cough and was not able to breathe during the assault, that brings a whole nother charge. You know, Jennifer may have talked about that, the strangulation law. So we always assess that. And what were they strangled with? One hand, two hand, what type of pressure was used? Um, and then what did the victim do afterwards? We ask a, a series of questions. Did they change clothes, shower? We can still collect evidence, but we still need to um, let the Department of Forensic Science know of why they may only get a little bit of DNA because there's been some interruption of the, collect of the evidence. Uh, did they use alcohol? Now this gets a little tricky, a little drugs, because again, you have that guilt. Well, I was drinking too much, and because family's gonna say, you know, you shouldn't have been drinking and, and drunk, you know, that's still there's no excuse for someone taking advantage of you, but particularly illegal drugs. A lot of our victims do not want to um, uh, 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 tell the truth because they, they, they fear criminal prosecution. So, but we do want to know that they experience a loss of consciousness. If there was a loss of consciousness and memory loss, then we may want to look. There was some date rape, date rape drugs used and do testing at that time. Then we also want to know if there's ejaculation. If it was, where did it happen? What side of your body did you, did you notice that so there was some ejaculation? If a condom was used, if it was, was it discarded? Did you see where they discarded? That is a really big, and, or if they used a towel. We just 
had a case recently where in, um, it was a discovery point during the nurse's examination that he used the towel and threw it in a corner. And one of the detectives went back, and that was the only thing that tied him to um, the place and to the sexual assault, because they went back from the report that we gave them. So it, it's important that we share and work together and we listen to the, to the history and to the narrative of the assault um, of the victim, that you never know what missing piece is needed to prosecute. So this could be a very um, long exam, including the... The narrative average, from the patient? Mm -hmm, average three to four hours. hours okay. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then if there were any objects inserted into any, uh, we say vagina, but you know, you have your rectal area or area of the orifices of your body. Blood samples, sometimes blood is collected as needed for date rape drugs, and, um, and that's done. And also at, in the follow-up medical examinations to test for HIV, syphilis, or any other diseases. Again, compassionate care, you get a whole lot of, you get, you get better narratives, you get better um, rapport with the victim when you're able to take the time. Um, you have four hours, but a lot of that four hours is listening. A lot of that four hours is, is telling and encouraging. A lot of four hours is we offer great snacks <laughs> and sometimes hot food. And we've, I've had a victim that hadn't eaten in three days. So, of course, her first need was for me to swab her mouth and allow her to eat. And then she was made comfortable. And then we were able, she was able to settle down and remember more, opposed to just rushing through and collecting and hurry up and tell the story. I don't have time for this. So we go in with our victims expecting four to six hours. But I've also done a, a case in one hour because only the oral cavity was, um, was, was involved. And so we took the story, didn't have to take clothes, swab their mouth, and they were able to leave, brush their teeth and leave. So, yeah, so I, like I said, I've collected in less than an hour, all the way up to six to eight hours with a victim. So what if the details of the assault sort of come back to mind later on? Can you go back and add those details to your report? That does not come to the, the forensic examination. You assure them, you, you make sure that they have contact with the detective um, and all resources they need to go to that law enforcement. They're the ones they need to fill those details in with. Okay. Yeah. Once we finish the and close this kit, our work is done until it's time to go to court. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, genital examination, a vaginal speckling examination for females are done. Uh, and there we're looking for internal injury. And also, uh, if they ejaculate in the vagina and it's been 72 hours, we've actually been able to find a pool of semen right there at the tip of the, at the bottom, the, uh, that would be the inferior portion of the cervix. You'll find a pool of the semen, even though they've taken baths and showers that uh, we've been able to find DNA still there. And that's why a speculum exam is important, um, particularly if it's been over 48 hours. It's more important than in the first 24 hours, we can get traces of semen on the labia majora and the uh, external aspects of the vaginal area. Okay, and because particularly in our young ladies, they've never had a speculum examination. And think about it, that area is usually very sore and tender. So that's part of the exam that is refused quite a bit because they cannot tolerate it. Mm -hmm. But we still can get DNA because we're using these long tip DNAs, I mean, long tip Q-tips and uh, these sterile Q-tips, and so that we're able to, from afar, swab what's needed. Even moving objects, we can, get, yeah, <laughs> we can collect what's needed. Traces of semen may be detected in the vagina on the surface for up to 72 hours. And there are some studies that shows up to 100 hours um, that semen is found and can be detected. Now, at our facility and some hospitals, they use coposcope. And what a coposcope is, is a large magnified, it looks like a microscope and a camera that have been merged together and is usually connected to a TV screen. And what it does is, uh, is um, be able to make your object much larger than what it is. So therefore, we can detect more um, minute injuries and bruises than you would just from the naked eye. Anal scopes may be utilized to detect anal tears, bruising, and semen. Physical evidence. Ideally, the rape kit should be used to collect the evidence, but I have seen in cases where people have paper bags, they have uh, Q-tips, and they collect the evidence and label it and seal it and still be able to turn that over to the detective 
uh, if they if a kit is not available. Now in this kit, we will collect pubic hairs. We don't pluck anymore. One day I used to pluck hairs. We <laughs> we are able to cut pubic hairs, head hair head hairs, uh, foreign matter on the body, which could include samples of the rapist's hair, blood, or skin may still be left on the body. Um, the clothes worn at the time of assault. Now let's say someone's changed their clothes and taken a shower. We still collect, particularly females, we collect their underwear. Their panties are always collected because there may have been some DNA still um, over the 48 to 72 hours um, been able to collect in the panty, the seat of the panties. So those are still sent. And we make sure that anything that's wet is dried. We have an air dryer or we just leave them on a line, um, um, a control area line to dry. Okay. Um, and then any pictures or documentation of any redness, swelling, scrapes, bumps, bruises, or other evidence of external injury. That's the physical evidence we're discussing. So on well, that slide you said they're collecting the clothes Mm -hmm. at the time of the assault. Does that also include the clothes they're wearing when they come into the, the facility? No. Okay. No. If those are not the clothes that we're wearing at the time of assault, they're able to leave in those clothes. Okay. Mm -hmm. We only collect undergarments that were close to the area that was assaulted that may hold some DNA. At that time. At, okay. at that time. No, those were not even at that time. Let's say you were raped. You went home. You took a shower. The next day you took another shower, put the panties, and then you came to us for physical evidence uh, greater than 48 hours, but you're still in that 72 hour window. As for women specifically, we will collect their panties because that's been close to the genital area that may have collected that ejaculate or the semen or any other DNA from the genital area. So we do col almost always collect panties regardless of the time. You know, they were not worn during the assault. Right. Yeah. But only the clothing worn during the assault is, is collected. Yeah. And we do have clothing available. Um, for victims to break to go home makes them feel a lot better and they take a shower at our facility as well so th if the client is still wearing clothing that's a good question that was worn during the time of assault the client may need to leave it as evidence so we let them we do not keep jackets unless there's certain tears or certain uh, blood stains or urine stains or ejaculation stain that have been dried into the coats but normally we do not take coats and we don't take shoes Okay, but everything else, or socks, but everything else we do take if they were wearing, if they were still wearing the clothing. And that goes into large paper bags, okay. In the majority of cases, the underwear will be collected, as we just said, and put into the evidence case. And it's very where we keep shoes. And everything goes in a paper bag. Now, let's say they went home and just threw those clothes in the dirty clothes. You alert the detective, you tell them to go home. A lot of times we send them home with the paper bag, but they'll need to call the detective and they'll go to their home and collect it so that the chain of custody will be maintained. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we do have to remind smaller police jurisdiction that they need to use paper bags and not plastic. <laughs> Always a teaching moment. External injuries, a physical examination will be done to look for bruises, scratches, cuts, and other external injuries, and we'll take pictures of those injuries as well. Uh, the same of police, if the police doesn't take pictures, the same does. But for completeness of our medical examination, the same always takes those external injury pictures. Pregnancy concerns. Victims will be given a pregnancy test at the time of the examination. That does not mean they can't have a forensic examination. And also that pregnancy test tells us that they were pregnant before the actual assault. Okay, we don't have a test that good, that great yet, but we're concerned if they are pregnant because that will guide us in giving in prescribing a prophylactic. There's some medications that a pregnant woman cannot take. Now, let's say we didn't detect the pregnancy and um, they were in fact pregnant. They find out two weeks later um, that and they took the uh, pregnancy pill. It would not disrupt an already implanted pregnancy. Um, because we do give the Plan B drug a heavy dose of hormones. It's called emergency contraception. It's sold over the counter, but we do provide it with our examination. And it's not to be confused with the termination pill or the R8486. So it would not disrupt the pregnancy. It would just prevent from the sexual assault a pregnancy. And it has to be given within the 72 hours. 
That's that is what I understand history wise. I'm not that old yet, <laughs> but but uh, I understand historically that is why the 72 hour limitation was set so that the pregnancy so that they would come in within that 72 hour that they could take the emergency drug. Mm -hmm. And that emergency drugs is an estrogen progestin combination, and when taken in appropriate dosages, it. Uh, Results administration which prevents pregnancy, and so you want to you want to alert them that they will have irregular periods. Uh, particularly health department, you may get um, ladies that. Uh, matter of fact, we refer um, our clients if they do not have a private physician, we refer them to our health departments for um, low cost or no cost follow up examinations. There they can come get their sexually transmitted uh, disease uh, testing, and they can also. Um, they can also talk to the nurse about why am I bleeding? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not my normal period, why am I bleeding? So it's good for you to know, and we send them with paperwork, telling them everything that we did during the examination, that you can tell them, hey, that's a common side effect of taking the Plan B drug, that it will disrupt your menstruation cycle. And it is recommended that, there, that this medication is taken with food because it almost always causes nausea and sometimes vomiting, particularly if they have uh, had a lot to drink the night before that they that we do experience our victims having vomiting. And that's another reason we give plenty of snacks because that helps um, them to tolerate the medication. Okay. Again, that's an outside view. We just love our place. That's an outside view of the Brooks Cellars one place in after hours, which is after five o'clock, Monday through Friday, and on the weekends and holidays, we have a private secure rear entry for the victim. Um, and they ring a doorbell, and we're a very secure facility. We have our police department on one level, but also uh, every door is locked and secure. So that makes our victims feel really good that they're safe. Okay. Okay, sexually tra transmitted diseases, or STIs. We need to change that disease, a sexually transmitted infection. The client may receive medications at the medical facility or a prescription for the three treatable STIs, more common STIs, is chlamydia, gonorrhea, and trichomonas. We do not do testing during the sexual, doing the evidence collection kit. No testing. But we do treat prophylactically. The current CDC approved medications are administered including Rocephin, that's the injection at this time, but you know CDC um, guidelines change quite often. The client should receive information for follow-up testing and medications and that's where the health department sexual transmitted STI clinics come in very handy. Um, and that's very important for the follow-up because at that time STI testing needs to be done. Uh, we have the Montgomery AIDS Outreach, um, and I understand they collaborate with your health departments. Right. That it's really great that they come and at least get tested for the first time for HIV infection. And that, and that is really a concern from someone that's been raped by an unknown suspect or the suspect that's known to be an IV drug user or are known to have HIV. We've had that happen in our Birmingham area quite often, and they've been able to... Um, they're still in the middle of a pilot program to where our facilities will be able to um, administer prophylactic HIV medications. They're working with uh, one of the pharmaceutical, a national pharmaceutical chain that would go ahead, they give them a prescription, it'll be, the, the uh, pharmacy would give them the first dose of medication right after the, um, um, the evidence collection kit's been made and then refer to a um, infection disease doctor to continue the treatment. So that is something we're working on or find payment through the state of Alabama to reimburse uh, the facilities. But it will be a great day when we'll be able to provide them with a prophylactic medication. But of course we'll do a risk assessment. Everybody doesn't need that. Okay, because the overall probability of HIV transmission from an HIV infected person doing a single act of intercourse depends on many factors. These factors may include the type of sexual intercourse, be it oral, vaginal, anal, is it presence of oral, vaginal, anal trauma uh, on, on the victim aspect to where it would receive that uh, virus, the site of exposure to ejaculation, and then the viral load in the ejaculate and the presence of an STI. So the transmission of not only H HIV or STI is so low. 
possibility is so low. And I think that's so great to tell our our victims because they are nerved about it. You know, they're they're that's a major concern, <laughs> major concern. So uh, we are really grateful to the health department helping us with follow ups. Okay. March 2015 update, Rape Crisis Center, okay, I just talked about that, about Birmingham. They, they're our pilot program of offering post-assault testing and prophylactic medication for HIV. Okay, we also remind the victim, that's one of their follow-up instructions, remind them they must have protected sex for the next six months for their health and their partner health, up to a year in order to protect themselves. Um, and again, go get testing. Stress follow-up to a private um, medical doctor or clinic for testing. We tell them, go home and tomorrow call your doctor, make an, um, um, make an appointment for a two-week examination. And we also let them know you don't have to tell the doctor that you were raped, that you were sexual assaulted, that you just feel that you need to be tested. Because again, that's a barrier in them seeking medical uh, attention because they don't want everybody to know that, that they've been sexually assaulted right away. We also remind them they cannot call our facility or the SANE or the physician that, that or, or nurse that collected evidence kit that we do not do testing. And I, and I strongly uh, teach our emergency rooms that do not do testing on the victim because sometimes that will be brought up in court. Let's say um, you, you discovered that you had trichinomas or gonorrhea at the time of the sexual assault. There's some clever defense attorneys that will try to turn that against the victim and try to say, well, you're a promiscuous, you know, and you had that disease already, okay? You hurt my client. So that's, that's another reason that we do not do testing at the time of uh, the uh, collection of the kit, okay? Because what we document will be brought out in court if it, if it makes the court. There are a number, of, now we're going to talk about alcohol and drug facilitated assaults. There are a number of ways in which the use of alcohol or drugs may contribute to an act of sexual assault. Do you know the number one um, substance used in sexual assaults? Found in the use of sexual assaults? Okay, go out on a limb. Um, alcohol? You got it. Ah. You're on the right limb today. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, believe it or not, still, alcohol is one of the number one substances still used in, um, in contributing to sexual assault. Okay? The sub again. I the answer was on the table. <laughs> in some cases, the victim may not be aware of the level of alcohol content in drinks provided by the perpetrator. And that's a clue. Uh, we've, we have victims that, on, and we assess this. Yeah, I was drinking, so how much did you have to drink? Well, I normally drink three glasses of wine a day, and I only had one glass, okay? So that's a ding-ding in our assessment that, hmm, could a rape drug been used in that one glass of wine when she knows, she knows her body that she can tolerate three glasses of wine or she can tolerate six beers and she only had two and then she was unconscious. Mm -hmm. So that again, um, knowing, being aware of how much they consume that night and how much do they normally consume, okay? One sip of wine may put me down. But <laughs> increasingly cases have been reported in which a variety of drugs are used by offenders to further impair the ability of the victim um, to prevent the assault, that they, they won't fight back. Believe it or not, uh, Vicine is colorless, odorless, easily accessible, but it takes a large volume, which is the dangerous aspect. You could have a very small body weight per, per person that's given a whole bottle of Vicine or a child, and it could cause some damages. But it's, what it is, it causes amnesia. But uh, there's a short recovery period, so they not, they, you know, the person doesn't go out, but they have no memory of what happened. So we have clever uh, assailants out there, I hate to say. <laughs> Again, your most common date drugs that you know when you hear day drug, they usually talk about a roofie or rofanol and GHB, and they're most frequently referred to. And, they'll call, and also ecstasy is used, even though it heightens up, uh, but used with alcohol and other um, medications, prescription and non-prescription, illegal drugs, uh, ecstasy a lot of times is involved in, 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 and it has been taken in by the victim. Um, but there are several dozen other drugs that um, can be used for that person, and they're readily available in this country and in Alabama, believe it or not. We talked about Vicine, 
Okay. So again, clues to substance-induced assaults may be if the client had been drinking alcohol and says their reactions were not in proportion to the amount of alcohol consumed or if they have no memory whatsoever of the sexual assault. The effects of these drugs can include drowsiness, impaired motor skills, dizziness, confusion, and amnesia. And we're talking about the drug-facilitated um, assaults. They may have, have had some of these symptoms. Okay. It is important to work from what the client remembered. And as you further stated, sometimes their memory comes back weeks later while they're sleeping and bits and pieces. So we also tell the victim, keep a journal on you, some paper near your bedside, and, and, and we warn them and let them know in, a, in advance that you may have bits and pieces of the assault come back with you, maybe a year later, but document it, you know, and then, you know, it's like, it's like picking up pieces of the puzzle, okay? And they, they, to put the whole picture together, it's gonna maybe pieces here and there, fragmented, fragmented memory. It's, uh, we find that quite a bit of those that experience this trauma of sexual assault. If medical personnel, law enforcement, or the victim have reason to suspect the use of drug by the perpetrator, an advocate should discuss with the victim the ramifications of any type of drug testing. Again, that goes back to they take, they take their blood and find out they how they take a urine test and find out that they have um, marijuana in the use. Again, that could be turned against them in the court of law. Documentation, documentation is any time in our medical profession is most important. If you document well in their narrative of their um, of sexual assault, that holds a lot more weight than evidence many a times. Uh, court cases have been won just from the nurse's documentation of what happened during the assault. Um, okay, and always, always a victim must give informed consent um, of any type of drug testing. So, there are two main reasons for the victim in making the decision of whether or not to consent to a test for drug facilitated rape. First, the drugs can be very difficult to detect, particularly your GHB has a very short half-life. Um, the victim has to be within six to eight hours of ingestion of that drug. Their blood needs to be taken to, able, to be able to detect the drug in their bloodstream. That is so unlikely. Number one, by the time they recover from taking the drug, and if they've had any type of alcohol or any other type of drug, it may be 12 to 15 hours later. So right there, you're probably going to get a negative result on a GHB testing. Very rarely is GHB tested. And again, a lot of your hospitals and facilities do not do them on site. So that test has to be sent to another facility, and it takes weeks a lot of times to get results. So um, that's one of the limitations of being able to detect of the date rape drug, GHB. And second, the victim may also be reluctant to consent to the test because of the fears or concerns regarding the use of illegal drugs that were not even related to the sexual assault. So those are just two barriers there of, um, that needs to be considered in getting permission to take um, lab tests for drugs. All right. Once detected by the crime lab, this information sh could be used against the victim. Again, that reiterates that how certain evidence can be used against the victim. That if you don't know, you can't use it. <laughs> Although the sexual contact is a crime regardless of whether or not the drug was consumed voluntarily, and I'm sure Jennifer discussed some of those in the first session on the dynamics of sexual assault. There's brand new legislation that went passed that protects the victim that even if they voluntarily consume, that it's still a crime. Uh, the victim may have legitimate fears related to this becoming public knowledge. You know, maybe their spouse doesn't know they use these drugs, and definitely children with parents do not want uh, their parents to know that they're using the illegal drugs. An additional concern for the victim who has voluntary ingested illegal drugs is that engaging in felonious criminal activity may make the victim ineligible for compensation through the Victims of Crime Compensation Fund uh, and, and other support services if tested possible. 
Information provided to the victim should include review of the types of drugs that will be detected by the test, explanation of the factors that make drug detection difficult, and clarification that a negative test result does not mean that a drug was not used. And we, we bring home these facts because there are some victims that say that they were drugged, they want to be tested, I have to have the test now, and really stress themselves out that it's very good that anyone um, that's in a social work position or nurse position to have this type of information to calm their nerves and tell them that's really not necessary in the prosecution process. It's not. I mean, there's more cases won without drug testing than with drug tests. Okay? Um, someone needs to be there to discuss the possible consequences of negative results and clarification that in a criminal case the results will be available to the defense and again may become public knowledge. So all these things have to be taken into play and the victim needs to know. That's why many of your courts have um, victim advocates that are able to explain this type of, these type of issues uh, throughout the prosecution process. Okay. For medical reasons, any illegal drugs she may, he or she may have had taken voluntarily, even if unrelated to result, um, assault, could contribute to any type of um, mental health or other medical decisions. So medical personnel really needs to do a great assessment on what did you take tonight without them feeling they can be prosecuted. Okay. Again, billing that rapport is very important to our victim. And you need to allow time for the victim to ask questions and discuss concerns related to any type of testing, not just the drug testing. Okay. Wow, that's a lot on, on drug, alcohol and drug facility. The medical facility should contact law enforcement or the Department of Forensic Science where to send the samples in order to maintain the chain of custody. That's also very complicated because all laboratory, one of our biggest lab chains in the state, yeah, in tri-state, tri area, and I'm not going to name them, but they are not able to do any of our testing because they cannot maintain the chain of custody. And it's my understanding that our Alabama State Department of Forensic Science is investigating of how they can standardize the testing and send out test packets and have a one central location of uh, tox toxicology testing. Right now, Birmingham does most of the um, toxicology testing for uh, cases for the state of Alabama. Again, as a reminder, Tell the victim, do not bathe, shower, or wash hands if it's within the 72 hours. Do not brush their teeth or gargle. Do not eat, drink, or smoke. Do not use the bathroom. If they have to use the bathroom, do not wipe. Okay? Do not change clothes. Leave every article of clothing you, have on, you had on during the sexual assault. Do not touch or move any items that may have traces of the assailant's DNA. That's very important in the, in the preservation of evidence that, that we may be able to collect and be able to successfully prosecute um, these that are um, the assailants, the sexual assault assailant. Let's see. I think we're near at the end. There's my contact information. Feel free to call at any time. Uh, any sexual assault nurse examiner we have on call should be able to answer your questions, but you can ask for me personally. My cell phone is always on. Uh, Standing Together Against Rape is a program of Lighthouse Counseling Center located in Montgomery, Alabama. But we have good news. We were just awarded a grant that we will be um, acquiring two recreational vehicles that will be serving our rural counties. And depending on how this goes, that may open up the door. We'll be the fifth state in the United States of, of, of America, of Alabama. <laughs> yeah, Alabama. But uh, um, that uh, would have this type of mobile unit program. And in that RV, we will have a full clinical site. We'll have area for the family to sit. We'll have an area that we'll be able to close off and have law enforcement and cameras in case they wanted to do any type of interviewing for children specifically. Uh, because in children, uh, we do see pediatric patients at our facility. But for children, it's important that they tell the story one time and one time only. Adults differently. Uh, our, our district attorneys tend to like uh, that the first officer on the scene 
get a narrative, and then the detective get a narrative, and then they love our narrative of the assault because we tend to get more because they're more comfortable with us and they trust nurses more. Um, and then several days later, the detective go and do a follow-up examination. Well, our district attorneys, they say they like that because they get bits and pieces from each narrative, okay? So the narrative is very important. But with children, because of the trauma involved, and we want children to be children, that they have what they call a one, um, and it's done by a professional forensic interviewer. And they do it on camera. And they do it in a room where it's also wired, whereas law enforcement, counselors, department, uh, DA, Department of Human Resources um, representatives are there. And so when that forensic interviewer is in there with the child, they're sitting in a different room watching on camera as they're doing the interview. And then they're able to feed questions, just like you today are able to take questions fed, and they ask the child. So our RVs are going to be set up for that, mm -hmm. that we'll have the cameras to be used in case we have a pediatric. And so the forensic interview can be done at the same time. We hope to partner with the Alabama Department of Health and maybe expand, expand on expand other type of services with these RV units, you know, for sustainability. But we're we are looking at around September that they'll be mobile that because they have to be outfitted for what we need. You know, we're taking a family recreational vehicle and turn it into a modified clinic. And also we need nurses. We need sexual assault nurse examiners. There are several classes that are going on within the state of Alabama. Also, if you go to the IAFN, International Association of Forensic Nursing website, they have an online course. It's somewhat expensive, but it gives you CEUs, it gives you the training, and you can contact me that we will give you your clinical training without any problems. But we're just grateful that uh, the state of Alabama has um, embraced the, uh, the use of nurses doing sexual assault exams. It's a long time coming. I've been involved over 30 years in emergency care and at least 20 years in sexual assault nurse examination and we have truly grown and we're just grateful um, for the community, particularly law enforcement and and um, our jurisdiction and our um, court systems love the sexual assault nurses because we're available for expert witnessing, we're available to come to court, whereas your physicians and nurses at hospitals, that's kind of tough to get off work to go. So um, it, it's, really, it's an ever-growing science, forensic nursing. Uh, it's forever growing, and we welcome more nurses. We don't want to take anybody <laughs> from the Department of Public Health, but we welcome more nurses to come and, and take call and take the course, if just for the learning purposes. Um, and so that just about concludes um, my presentation. Uh, again, this is a 12-step program, 12-step uh, kit, 12 steps, and it is sealed at the end and initialed. And it goes to the Department of Forensic Science by a law enforcement official. I don't think I covered that. And your chain of custody is on the front of the box. So tell your victims that um, it sounds tough, a forensic examination. What is it? What are they going to do to me? Now you know what we're going to do. We make them feel comfortable. We only use a Q-tip. We don't know needles involved except for the medication for uh, sexual transmitted diseases, but that's our purpose today is that you know the medical issues involved in collection of evidence related to sexual assault. And thank you so much for joining us. We do have a question. Okay. It says, have you encountered minors or students from local colleges, college campuses, and do you have any advice in dealing with them? Hmm. I have encountered, uh, encountered uh, college students um, it's difficult for college students to report, but as you know, on a national level, the Office of Violence Against Women and Alabama State University is a model um, institution. They have a division of uh, the Violence Against Women Act division, and they are very aggressive in setting up their policy and procedure, and they have a memorandum of understanding with us that when a sexual assault happens on campus, they immediately call us and bring them over. Again, in that instance, because the student is embarrassed, they will, a good majority of the time, want to do a Jane Doe. And we do the Jane Doe, but later on, through counseling, they come back with law enforcement and pick up that kid and begin prosecution. Um, again, we, we hear from the uh, students that it happens quite regularly. Um, 
and you, that's how we do. Yeah, minors, we do have, because we, we just started two years ago seeing pediatric patients, and that's defined as anyone under the age of 12. We've seen patients as early as five months uh, where there was suspected abuse, um, and, and of course, quite a few patients between 10 and 13. But college students are very challenging, because number one, they feel that they, they brought it on to themselves and they don't feel comfortable reporting to security. They don't think they'll be um, um, taken seriously. And they definitely don't want their parents to know because they know they'll be angry. But there's a lot of resources out there. There's a lot of focus on campus-wide sexual assault. And I know in Montgomery, Alabama, that, they, that they're actively working with us. And we go out and we help teach. And they know that we're, that we're here. And they'll call us. Um, uh, college students without involving law enforcement. We have another related okay. question to that. It says, in the news recently, sexual assault among athletic teams is in the forefront. Colleges and universities are mandated by law to investigate sexual assaults to their students, and several are in trouble for not doing so. Mm -hmm. What is being done locally with the universities to help with investigating reported sexual assaults? I know for sure that all of our local campuses, security police departments are getting intensive training through the AUM Law Enforcement Training Program, number one. Several of them sit, sit on our Domestic Violence Task Force, Domestic Violence Sexual Assault Task Force, and so that we're always engaging in dialogue, and they have my personal cell number. Um, they're having, like during April, our Sexual Assault Awareness Month, on several of the campus we've had uh, open dialogue, and they know where their resources are. Um, so all I know is that there is a lot of um, light being shined on each university. And I visited each university, and they have brochures, Huntington, um, um, Faulkner, all of our local Montgomery universities that I have personally visited and there's at least one designated person there either in their social work or counseling department or administrative department and definitely security department where they have a team of people that work together and, and have resources available to the students so that, you know, um, everything will be good. And the thing is, is making our victims comfortable to come forth. And because it is in the highlight, I, we've seen a marked increase in the number of, of um, young college-age students call and report wow. or seek counseling. Yeah. So thank goodness for the media. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, Val, thank you so much for joining You're us so today. You're and so I welcome. want to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time on the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Thank you so much.